Hello and welcome to another video. In this one we're going to be talking about exargs, which uh, if I had to point to one thing that I think made me a better terminal user slash programmer, it would definitely be exargs. So I think, I hope that this video contains some really useful information for you as well. Um, but I'm going to go over some of the main usages that I have for exargs and then explain kind of what, it, what it's doing behind the scenes. Um, but anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so the idea behind exargs, and actually if we man exargs, I believe that, um, well, maybe it doesn't really give you the, a good explanation, um, but what it says here is it builds and executes command lines from the standard input. And now what, what I think of it as is a way to fold arguments into, or fold input into arguments. So I'll give you an example here. Let's say I make two files, touch foo and bar, um, and I wanted to run a command on both those files. Now I could just do something like, you know, ls star, and the star in my shell will expand to both of these. Uh, but that's not quite exactly what I want. So like maybe I want to um, print like hello, then the file name, then world or something like that. Um, actually, that's kind of hard. <laughs> Let's just do hello, hello, and then the file name um, for our very first example here. And the way you would do that is you would use exarch. So it's going to take these two arguments and it's going to fold them into positional arguments after this echo command here. So it's going to take the input as part of this pipe and turn it into arguments. And so maybe we want hello, hello. And you can see that we get hello, hello, bar foo. So it has inserted uh, these two characters onto this command here. Or sorry, these two arguments onto this command here. Um, and it will continue to do that as far as it needs to go. Uh, but it will, it will also respect operating system limits. So there's a cer certain length that commands can have. On Windows, it's pretty small. It's like 8,000 Unicode glyphs or something like that, or UTF-16 glyphs, or I, I don't exactly remember. Uh, on POSIX, it's really, really large. Uh, you can actually show the limit by doing exargs, um, and we'll, we'll go over what this command does in a second. No run if empty, and show limits. The important part is this uh, show limits bit here. These are both GNU extensions, so these probably won't work on Mac OS if you were trying it there. Uh, but if you're on a, you know, a, a GNU system, it will work there. Um, and I did it in the wrong order. Why is it still? Oh, I guess I have to control D. <laughs> I guess this one isn't necessary. Xargs, no, uh, Xargs show limits, and then just control D. Uh, I did a video about control D, so I'll show that. I'll, I'll link that below, but it just sends end of file. Uh, but you can see here that it's telling me like uh, how long the arguments can be. It's an extremely large number, although you, it's possible to hit this. Um, and the size of command buffer that it allows, which is right around 130,000 characters, which is definitely uh, attainable. I've definitely hit this a bunch of times, and Xargs is one way to make sure that your commands don't get too long. Uh, but anyway, that's that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is the ways that you might use this to write shell scripts and make things better. So let's actually take this first example, and I'll show you a couple ways to improve this. Uh, there's actually some problems with this. Notably, ls should not be used in scripting, uh, and maybe we want to run you know one file at a time. Uh, maybe we want to do this in parallel. I'll show you how to do all those things. Uh, so let's start with this. Uh, we'll fix ls in a bit, but let's say we wanted to... Uh, do this once per file. Right now we're splatting all of the arguments into a single echo command. Um, and another thing that I like to do to show what's going on is to use the dash verbose option. Uh, and this will tell you exactly what command it's about to run and then it will run the command. So in this case, you'll see that it's about to run echo hello hello world bar foo. Uh, and then we get the output here. If you're on Mac OS, which again, crippled BSD system, <laughs> doesn't have dash dash verbose because that's a GNU extension, you'll use dash T. And just to eat is the same same thing. Um, but now I want to do this. I want to do this command once for every input. So right now we're putting all the inputs onto one command. Um, so let's do dash n one. Dash n configures the max number of arguments that can be used in a particular command. So in this case, you'll see now that it has split it up into two separate commands. Uh, and so you know we get we get two outputs here. Another way that we can do uh, dash n1 is by using dash dash replace. And again, dash dash replace is uh, a GNU extension. Um, by default, it takes a de default argument equal to curly brace, curly brace. Um, but, you know, <laughs> uh, 
uh, just just on its own, it works that way. But on macOS, you have to explicitly put the argument after it. And so this dash capital I says, replace these curly braces with whatever argument. And it, it also implies dash n1. Um, and so if I do this now, you'll see that it didn't actually forward my arguments along. And that's because I didn't use my replacer anywhere. Uh, but maybe I want to print, you know, the, the particular file name a bunch of times. And you can see, like, it will substitute that as many times as you want. And you can use this to do more complicated shell pipelines where you might replace one of the file names with another file name. Um, so let's maybe, I don't know, one example might be we are copying this file name to uh, this file name dot back. And so you can see we've created bar dot back and foo dot back by doing this copy statement here. So we replaced bar with bar dot back, for instance. Um, that might be one example that you would do there. Uh, another thing you might want to do is do these in parallel. So Xargs is really useful for doing a lot of parallel operations. And uh, I'm actually going to uh, clone a repository here. Pre-commit slash pre-commit, just so we have some files to work with. That'll be a little bit more interesting than what we've shown so far. Let's see what we've done. Oh, I want to show you one other thing. So uh, before we do that, Xargs echo. Uh, yeah, so we did this, oops. Well, there's, there's a lot more files here this time. Uh, so one thing about Xargs is it takes a command after it, but if you leave the command out, it defaults to echo. And this can often be useful for either debugging or for, uh, you know, just folding arguments and then passing them along to something else. Um, so you can see here that, you know, we fold up the arguments of ls and we don't actually call echo here. The, the Xargs is you know, the same as Xargs echo. In fact, if we do dash T, yeah, you'll see that it even it even puts in this echo command here. Um, so that's that's the default there. Wanted to make sure I cover that before I go into the next thing. Um, but let's talk about doing stuff in parallel. So let's maybe say that I want to run Flagate against a bunch of my files. Now Flagate has, you know, recursion, and so it knows how to recurse into all these files, but let's pretend like we're working with a tool that doesn't have something like this. And so what you can do with Xargs, and I'm actually going to use git ls files, which is, again, one of my other favorite commands that I don't know that I've covered on a video yet. But let's say we're going to you know, run Flagate on particular Python files. So I ran git ls files with startup py. Uh, let's say that we want to filter to the testing directory. So maybe we'll do grep testing. And that'll filter down to these set of files. That way it's a little bit easier to see. And now maybe I want to run Flagate on all these files. And so I'll do xargs flake eight. And this ran it all in one process. If we did dash t, you'll see that it ran flake eight and put all of these files on these on, a, on one command line here. But I have a bunch of processors on my computer. Let's see, cat proc cpu info, actually do grep. I forget what the, <laughs> I figure out what it is. Grep processor, grep processor. Okay, so I have five processors assigned to this virtual machine. So I can potentially do a lot more uh, Flake 8 processes in parallel. Now, granted, Flake 8 actually has multiprocessing behind the scenes, but we'll pretend like we don't have that for today. Um, but you can specify dash capital P, and that'll tell how many processes to use in Xarg. So let's say we did dash P5. Now, um, this actually isn't all that useful on its own. You'll see it still ran only one process. Um, and so my good rule of thumb is if you're using dash capital P, you should also use dash N. That way it has the potential to split it up into multiple uh, processes here. So I, you know, figure out a number that works for your input. In this case, I'm just going to use 5.5, five, for instance. Oh, actually, is that going to split it up? Okay, that's split it up into two commands. <laughs> Let's do dash N2, for instance. And you can see that it spun up a bunch of different processes to, to solve this problem. And it did these all in parallel, which is cool. So if one of your processes is slow, um, you're potentially reducing the amount of time that you spend doing all that computation. Okay, that's capital P. We've done dash N, we did capital I, we did verbose. Uh, we have two more things to show. Uh, I guess, well, actually we kind of have three more things to show. So one problem with XR, let's actually go back to here. Uh, we'll delete pre-commit for now. One problem with Xargs that you'll run into pretty often is if you have a file with spaces in it. So let's create a file. And I'm using quotes here to, um, 
to name this file. So you can see we now have a file called bar, we have a file called foo, and we have hello space, hello space, world as a file. And if we did ls and then pipe that to xargs, and again we'll do dash dash for both and dash add one, um, and again you'll use you'll use the macOS options if you're on macOS. Uh, you'll see here that it split my file name into three different arguments here, which is not what we want. We generally want to preserve the set of arguments here. And this is again where like LS makes a poor scripting tool. It's not really intended for scripting, and so its output is more for humans to read, and Xrx doesn't really know what to do with it. Uh, that said, we can fix LS by doing LS-1 and then doing xargs with dash d. So what, what one does, um, let's just do ls dash one first. What one does is it makes one thing show per new line. Uh, and then we can tell xargs to delimit on a new line, which is what dash d does. And so this will say, split the input on new lines and then each argument is one line. And so if we do that now, you'll see that uh, it properly splits this up. But again, like ls is not intended for scripting. You can abuse it to do scripting, but it's, it's not really intended for that. Uh, what you should use is find, um, and again, if you're on uh, macOS, you'll need find dot, but I'm going to not use macOS because um, I have a modern system. <laughs> find uh, dash type f, this filters things as files. Oops, that was weird. I'll probably do a video on find at some point as well. And max depth one, that way it doesn't recurse, and... Um, Let's see, warning you specified after the argument dash type. Okay, dash max depth one. <laughs> Even I sometimes do things wrong. Oops, max depth space one. Find is a little bit of a weird utility. The arguments are more like a program and less like actual command line arguments. Uh, but you can see we've got our three file names here. It's weird that they're in a strange order, but uh, I guess that's inode ordering instead of sorting. Um, but you can see that this is printing them one per line, and we could again do that xargs dash d new line verbose dash t and see that it um, dash on one. <laughs> oh, I did verbose twice. <laughs> anyway, um, you can see that this works and it preserves that. But again, I wouldn't recommend using dash d new line. Uh, this isn't going to work if things contain new lines in them, uh, which is possible, but you know, unlikely for file names. Uh, but you might use other arguments that have new lines in them. What I would suggest instead is to use null delimiting, and the way you can do null delimiting, uh, first you have to make the thing that pipes into XRs use null byte delimiting, and then have the thing that outputs use null byte delimiting. Uh, for the find command, that's using dash print zero, and you can see it kind of like splats all the arguments together. If you hex dump this, which I should probably do a video about hex dump as well, I haven't done that yet, uh, you can see that there are null bytes separating each of the files, and this is uh, really, really helpful because it makes the output machine readable. It knows that this can't possibly appear in an argument, and so it has to be something that's splitting it. Um, and then we will follow that up with xargs version of reading null delimited stuff, which is dash zero. So this will split its input based on null bytes. And again, if you just do dash zero with no arguments, it's defaulting to echo. If you dash one, you'll see that it, it regurgitates um, you know, each of those commands by using echo. And so that's what's really useful for dash, dash zero and dash print zero. Oh, I should have kept that repository around. <laughs> um, if you're doing this with git, for instance, git ls files has a dash z option, um, and this will null delimit each of your file names, and so then you can do xargs dash zero. Let's do dash n1 and n5 to show just the first top of them. But anyway, <laughs> it printed the first five, and then it was uh, exited by pipe. Um, but yeah, that's dash zero. Uh, I have one last thing to show, which is the uh, no run if empty. So sometimes you might uh, find files. So let's do uh, max depth one, um, type f for some for, for instance. And maybe we want to grep for files that look like, um, oh, hi. And you'll notice that there's zero arguments that are returned here. If I do xargs uh, verbose, you'll see that it still ran a default echo command here, and we don't want that. Sometimes a command with no arguments will do something completely different. Like for instance, if we did xargs dash verbose flake8, flake8 with no arguments is gonna run on every single file, which we really wanted it to run on zero files because nothing matched. And so 
Uh, one thing that you'll want to do in this case is use no run if empty. And again, this is a GNU extension, so it's not going to be available on macOS. Um, but this will prevent Flakegate from running in this particular case because there were no inputs. Um, so I think that's all the things that I want to show. There's a lot of stuff that happened here, um, but I, I find that <laughs> I find that Xargs is is really really useful for stepping up your command line to the next level. Um, I, I definitely became a much better programmer once I once I figured out how to use this and once I was comfortable using it. Um, I guess one last thing that I want to cover is uh, ways to make a command safe that you want to validate the command before you run. And uh, let's do, for instance, I was doing some sort of, um, you know, destructive command where maybe print zero and uh, we did xargs dash zero uh, rm. Maybe we want to delete the files. Now, granted, there is a better way to do this with find directly, but let's say for the sake of discussion, we want to, we want to delete the files. Uh, one thing that I find is useful is to put an echo in front of it. That way you can see what command it's about to run before it does this. There's also an interactive mode for Xargs. Um, I don't really like the interactive mode. I like to see what it's going to do and then run it. Um, and so I find this to be really useful. Another thing that I often do is when I'm like replacing things uh, is to do bash dash X in like some sub process here. So maybe I did uh, move thing to thing dot back. Um, and you can see these are the commands we were about to run because we put echo here. Uh, and then I can debug one level further, move the echo inside of the bash command. And you can see that bashes, uh, oops, this should be XC. <laughs> I made a bug. Um, you can see that bash will tell you what command it's about to run. Um, it didn't actually run that command because we put the echo here. And then finally, once we're happy with that, we can remove the echo and run the actual command. Um, well, I should have noticed that there was a bug here because we didn't do the quoting properly, but <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Uh, so this is Xargs. Hopefully this was useful. If you have additional things you want me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.